All right, take your Bibles back to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start our sermon. Ephesians chapter 5. The title of the sermon tonight is We Are an Independent Church. We Are an Independent Church. So the thought that I want to take out of Ephesians chapter 5, it compared the relationship that Christ has to his church as that of a relationship between a husband and a wife. Okay? What do I want to take out of this? First of all, that Christ is the head of the church. Number one reason why we are an independent church, what does it mean to be independent, is that Christ is the head of this church. Christ is the head of the church in Caloundra. There is no intermediate between this church and Christ. Okay, it's not me. I'm part of this church. There's no intermediate. There's no intermediate body. There's no president or organization that sits between Christ and his church. And God uses the analogy between a husband and wife. Okay, it takes the analogy of a married couple. Between the husband and the wife, there is no one between there, is there? Children shouldn't get in between the husband and the wife. And it says that the husband is the head of the wife and that the wife ought to be subject to the husband. That's not very popular teaching today, right? But, you know, guys, we need to train our children. And this is going, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the church. But we need to tra train our children, especially our daughters, because they're growing up in a society that does not respect the marriage, does not respect the authority that the husband has above his wife. And ladies, little girls, especially those that aren't married yet, you need to understand when you get married, that man that you're marrying is going to be your authority. So you better make sure that you marry the right guy. Okay, make sure that you marry a believer. Make sure you get dad's tick of approval. That's biblical. Yes, it is to get that stick of approval, but there is no authority, there is nothing between, once you're married, there's nothing between the husband and the wife, the husband's the authority, and the wife is subject to the husband. You might say, that's unfair, Kevin. It's unfair that the husband has the authority. But the man is told, the husband is told, you've got to love your wife to the point that you ought to die for her, right? Just how Christ was willing to die for the church. What's harder, to, to be subject to the husband or for the husband to give up his life? For his wife. I think it's harder to give up your life, to die for your wife, to love them to that point where you're willing to die for that person. So look, there's, a, there's, there's responsibility for the husband and there's a responsibility for the wife. But just to, just to use that analogy the Bible speaks about, is it right for the church to be in authority of Christ? Is it right for the church to tell Christ, hey, we'll do things the way we want to do it? No, that's wrong, right? And that's just as wrong as it is for a wife to tell the husband, hey, no, you're not my authority. No, I'm not going to do the, way, the things the way you want me to do them. It's the same mess. It, it's, it's ridiculous to think that a church could have authority over God. A church has authority over Christ. It's just as equally ridiculous for the wife to have authority over the husband. And that's, you know, obviously that teaching is unpopular. It's out of season. It's out of fashion today. But that's why we have broken homes all over the place because no one now wants to adhere to the Word of God. But Christ is the head of the church. So we're an independent church. We have Christ, we have His Word, Jesus Christ, the Word of God. We have the Bible, which is the written Word of God, as our authority. Okay? Yes, again, I've been given the overse overseer, I've been given the rule in the congregation, right? But I do not, you know, I am not above Christ. I have to make sure that everything that transpires in this church is to honor our Lord Jesus Christ. So, number one, the main reason why we are an independent church is Christ is the head of the church. Because when you think about denominations, you think about churches that are not independent, they will have some organization above that church before Christ, right? Because they need to make sure that however they run their church, whatever they preach in the church, lines up with that organization's teachings, okay? Now, we're Baptists. There's the Baptist Union. I'm, I'm not sure if they're still called the Baptist Union, but there's one in New South Wales, there's one in Queensland, and then I think they all get together and there's one, a national one. I might be mistaken. But basically, the Baptist Union has to... And, and I've checked Baptist Union's statement of faith on their website, and that they say on their website, oh, we believe just like the union does. <laughs> They're not even bothered to write their own statement of faith anymore. They're like, oh, yeah, just like the Baptist Union. Because they have to make sure if they're going to be a member of that union, they're going to be a member of that denomination, they need to make sure... It doesn't matter anymore what the Bible says. It's what the union says, and we need to make sure that we don't you know, step on anyone's toes. You know, I was out soul winning with a, with a brother. Um, I won't name him or the church, but he was explaining to me that the church that he's been attending, 
that the pastor, you know, the, the bishop has been preaching hard against homosexuality, has been preaching hard against women preachers, because this denomination apparently allows women pastors, preaching hard against these things, and so they sent someone from the organization to reprimand him, to tell him, hey, you can't preach these things anymore, you need to stop that, or else... You know, or else you might lose your position or who knows, you might lose your finances, you might lose your support, what have you. And this is not right. We cannot allow for an organization to exist between the church and Christ. That is why we're an independent church. And you might say, well, what about the church in Punchbowl? Didn't the church in Punchbowl send you out here and don't you need to report back? No, I don't need to report back to the church in Punchbowl. Once I was ordained, once the church has sent me to, to uh, commence and establish this church, in Cloundra, we essentially cut ties as far as authority goes. Yes, I was under the authority of Victor when I was in that church, but now, no longer, okay? Now, I would like to continue ties. I would like to have relationships with that church and being able to work together and do things on a national scale if possible. That would be fantastic. But Victor doesn't ring me up and say, Kevin, what are you preaching today? You know, does it line up with what I taught? You know, is it contrary to what I taught? No, he doesn't check that, you know? And I'm not required to report back to them, but I probably will, you know, just as a courtesy, just so they know that things are going very well in this church and how much we've done. I probably will report back just to show them the great work that's been, you know, that's been done here in Caloundra. But it's not a requirement and they are not the head of this church and we are not the head of that church, okay? We are independent church. This is what it means to be independent. Christ is the head of this church. Now, just to show you a couple of things here, Acts 14, verse 23, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it. Acts 14, 23 says this, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So this is where they actually ordain elders to commence churches, to establish churches, to have leadership in a church. And what do they do once they pray and fast? They commend those elders to the Lord, not to themselves. Okay, not to some organization, but they're like, hey, we've done the job, we've ordained you, get that church running, and we're commending you to the Lord. The Lord's in charge of what you're doing, not us. Okay, just to show you that, Hebrews 13 verse 17 says this, it says, obey them that have the rule over you, and as uncomfortable as I am saying this, but that's what the Bible says, I have the rule over you in the church, right? So you're being commanded to obey me, to have the rule of you in the church and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So this account that we give for your souls is an account that we give to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how this works exactly, but when we're taken up to heaven, Every bishop, every pastor, every church will give an account for his church and the souls in his church, right? And then it says, uh, that they, that, sorry, that they may give that account with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So it sounds like, yes, you receive your rewards for the work you've done, but there's also further rewards given to the church for being in obedience to the bishop within the church and for taking those things into consideration, for growing in the Lord. But if you disregard what is being taught in the church, if you disregard what's being taught in the Word of God, that's going to be unprofitable to you. I assume you're going, you'd lose rewards. You wouldn't gain rewards that you would have. My point is to show you this, is that the bishop must give an account directly to God. Okay? It's not directly to another bishop. It's not to an organization. The account is given to God. All right? So I, as a preacher of the Word of God, must preach the Word of God with a clear conscience. I've got to preach this. And, and, you know, I've had discussions with some of you, and and I know there are some things we don't fully agree with, right? But I need to give an account and have a clear conscience before God, right? I have to give that account for this church. And so I just want to show you why that's important, why it's important that we are an independent church, Because I need to make sure that I line up with what I believe the Word of God says as my authority. I can't be worried about some church that sent me out and what they think about what I'm going to preach. I can't be worried about what some organization says, you know, uh, thinks of what I'm going to preach. I have to preach the Word of God. I do do not want to be like these other pastors out there that are afraid to preach God's Word because of what, you know, their, their peers might say or what some organization might say. No, I only care about what God 
has to say, what, what, you know, the account that I've got to give to God. I might even have to offend you sometimes, but I don't want to offend God. Okay, I, I do not want to offend God. So if I offend you sometimes, guys, you know, feel free to let me know if I've, if I've offended you. But please keep in mind that I do it not because I want to attack you, but simply because I want to please the Lord God. I must give that account directly to Him. So what are some denominational problems? You have denominations, right? You have organizations, and you might have a president. Or if you look at the Roman Catholic Church, who's their president? It's the Pope, right? And the Pope, basically, what he says is equal to the Word of God. And I know recently, and, and probably in the last 20 years or more, you know, the Roman Catholic Church have now accepted um, evolution, have accepted that probably, you know, they think it's a good explanation, it's a reasonable explanation that man evolved from apes. They don't care anymore what the Word of God says. They don't care anymore what Genesis 1 says. And I remember my, my, uh, my wife, growing up as a Catholic, she'd come home from school in, in a Catholic school and tell her mom, did you know we evolved from apes? And even her mom as a Roman Catholic is like, no, that's not what the Bible says, you know. But hey, if you're under a dom denomination and they get corrupt, or that Pope gets corrupt and just teaches whatever, they disregard the Bible, guess what those Catholic schools have to do or those Catholic churches have to do? They've just got to toe the line. They've got to make sure they line up with the Pope because the Pope's word is the final authority in the Roman Catholic Church. The same thing can happen with any church, any kind of Protestant or Baptist denominations. If that organization gets corrupt, or if they start teaching perverse things, they start allowing you know, homosexuality in the church, they start allowing women preachers, then those churches, guess what? As much as they might disagree with that, they have to line up with that. Otherwise, you know, they might lose their positions in the church. So those are some of the problems that come up. Um, do doctrinal alignment, they have to align doctrinally, even if what is being taught and what is accepted in that organization is error. Um, there is a fear of finances. Many of these denominations give a portion of their uh, offering to those organizations so they can run and they can support themselves, right? And then many times that money is circulated amongst this church or that church, right? There are smaller churches where maybe the offering is not sufficient to provide for that pastor, so that pastor then is required to, to you know, uh, is living off, basically, that denomination's giving, and so, is he going to preach things that are contrary to the denomination, even if he sees it clearly in the Word of God? Of course not. He's going to have money as, on his site and his position as his site. And so, you know, the other problem I've already discussed is, is that accountability that should be direct to Christ is removed in favor of accountability to that denominational head. And uh, I, I know some of these problems. Um, I, I've recently spoken to... Um, some Calvinists, and again, there are some Calvinists that are not Calvinists, right? And they're part of a denomination. They're part of a denomination, and, and they line up perfectly with us in the gospel. Perfectly, right? If they preach the gospel door to door, you would see no problem whatsoever, right? And I've had discussions, and they're like, yeah, we're trying to get away from Calvinism. We know that's false. We're trying to move away from that. But guess what? They can't preach openly against it. They can't fully remove it out of their church because the denominational headquarters says, no, that's what we believe. So even though you have these people, they're stuck. You know? They want to escape these, these, uh, these uh, you know, prison bars of the denomination circle. They want to move away from false doctrine, but being stuck in that denomination means they have, to try, they have to still give lip service to it, even though that's not what they believe anymore. So you can see the problems that denominations have. And even though we're a Baptist church, we are not part of a Baptist denomination. We're independent fundamental Baptist. And the next sermon, well, today I'm preaching on in, being in, in, an independent church. Next week, it's, Lord willing, it's going to be on why we're fundamental, and the week after, it's Lord willing, why we're Baptists. Okay? But what does it mean to be independent? It means we're self-governing. Turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. The church is self-governing. And I want to show you that the early church in the Bible were independent churches. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. This is the first time that deacons are appointed in the church. Look what it says here. In those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve, who are the twelve? The apostles, right? Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. And basically, just to give you the context, this is in the church in Jerusalem. This is in the church in Jerusalem. 
Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out, look, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we give ourselves but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and uh, Prochorus, and uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and pa Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So we see this church in Jerusalem... They needed to govern themselves. They needed to appoint some deacons to help the, uh, the bishops of this church, to help the apostles, to help deal with the daily ministration. And in this case, the widows were being neglected in the church. And they chose, but look, look what they said. Hey, you, the church, you choose men amongst yourselves. It's something done within the church. They didn't have to go to some organization and say, hey, can you approve this decision we're making in this church? Can you select? No. The church itself selected those people. And look what it says in verse uh, uh, number five. And it pleased the whole multitude. So this was something done in the church. I just want to show you that the church was self-governing. They appointed their own deacons um, that we see in the scriptures. They didn't have to go to some denominational headquarters and get approval for that. Number two, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. What I'm going to be talking about now is every church has self-discipline. There is discipline to be done within each church on its own. Self-discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to 13. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And if you remember, this is, this is one of the worst churches you're going to read about in the New Testament. It says here, But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one do not, uh, know not to eat. For what have I to, uh, to do to judge them also that are without? Pay attention here. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Put, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So we see every church here, the Corinthian church is being told, hey, you can have your own self-discipline in the church. These people that are fornicators, covetous, drunkards, they should not be allowed in the church. And you're within your own right. I don't have to tell you this, he says. He says in verse number 12, do not ye judge them that are within. Hey, you have the authority to judge people like this within your church and kick them out of the church. You don't need to get Paul the Apostle's approval. You don't need to get the approval of the denominational headquarters. You don't need to get approval from any other church, anyone else. Self-governing, self-discipline we see here. And so we see the independence of the church and how it is to be run. Number three, you're already in 1 Corinthians, turn to chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. Each church is required to judge internal, personal problems, right? If there's problems within individuals in the church, and hey, as we grow, we're going to have problems with individuals within the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is no, not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So in this story, we have two brethren that uh, are in dispute. They're not getting along. They think one has defrauded the other. They can't get justice. Paul says, hey, just set the least esteemed. The person that's the youngest Christian, the one with the less reputation, let's put him as the judge, right? He can judge the church. And he goes, I speak to your shame. You should have dealt with this already, right? So I just want to show you that the church, the um, local church that we have, is to judge internal problems between believers. Again, no need to go to the apostles. We don't have apostles today, today anyway. No need to go outside of that. No need to go to some denominational headquarters to get uh, the authority to do that. So I just want to show you that, hey, every church, 
has its own right to deal with personal problems. And number four, I'll just read very quickly. First, oh, you're in 1 Corinthians, you might as well turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Finances. Finances. Now, should finances be taken to some, you know, some body where they then recirculate it and, and give it out to churches? Now, we don't see that happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So Paul is saying, hey, there's a collection of the saints. It happens in the churches in Galatia. I'm not sure how many churches there were there. That's what's happening there. Even so do, you, do ye. So you, the Corinthian church, you guys have a collection as well. Okay? Every church is to have their own collection, uh, their own finances. Churches should be self-financed and not going off the finances. Now, there's a different story if you send a missionary overseas and they're planting churches and, and the finances are different because it's a poor nation. We'll see later on that churches are required to support one another. But that is not a mandatory requirement because we are independent churches. Churches should be self-financed. Um, I've got some other things here. I won't go into it right now, but some of the other points I have under finances is that pastors were paid by the church and widows in the church were taken care of by the church if they had no one else to take care of them. Okay, but those finances came within the church and they were then given to help not just the pastor, but other people in the church that needed assistance, especially the widows. All right, so I'll, I'll go into those things at some other time um, because I think finances needs its own sermon. Um, but all that to say this, we stand as an independent church, Christ is our head, the Bible's our authority, everything that's taught behind this pulpit ought to come from the Word of God. But does that mean then that we just isolate ourselves and we have nothing to do with other churches in our area? We have nothing to do with other churches in our nation. We have nothing to do with other churches in the world. Is that right? No. Because even though we're independent churches, what we see clearly taught in the Bible is that churches did work together. Churches did work together. Turn with me to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 verse 23. Romans 16 verse 23. Romans 16, verse 23. Paul writing to the Roman church, he says, Gaius, mine host, and the whole church... And by the way, many people believe that this letter was written from the Corinthians. Okay, so it's from the Corinthian church. Gaius from the Corinthian church. Gaius, mine host, and the whole church, the Corinthian church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Quartus, a brother. So we have this church, and individuals within this church, in the Corinthian church... It's not just Paul, but those other members saluting the church in Rome. So there ought to be fellowship between churches that are like-minded. We see that in the Scriptures. Turn to, uh, oh, were well, you already there? Chapter 16, look at verse number 1. Verse number 1, chapter 16, Romans 16, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is in Crenchia, that ye receive her in the Lord as become of saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you, for she hath been a succourer of many and of myself also. So we have Phoebe, this sister, coming from the church in Crenchia, coming to visit the church in Rome. I'm not sure what business she's doing there. I don't know if she's visiting family or vis going on holidays or maybe just going to assist the church. But we do see members of churches visiting other members of like-minded church. That, that's, that ought to happen, right? If you're ever out, you know, um, away from this area, ideally you'd find a church that you can visit and be a blessing to, and they can be a blessing to you. So it's fine for members to visit other churches. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and then I'll just read to you Acts 11, verse 27 to 29. It says, and in, these in a, uh, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Okay, so you have prophets, preachers coming from, Jerus from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should, there should be great dearth throughout all the world. So there would be a great drought amongst the, in the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So in the Antioch church, because they knew the brethren in Judea were suffering because of this drought, they got together to send relief. I don't know, that was probably financial aid. There could have been food, water, these kind of things were sent to this church. So it's fine to give aid from one church to another. 
we ought to work together even though our churches are independent and not one church has the authority over the other. Number four, we ought to encourage each other. We see in Acts 11, verse 22 to 24, then tidings of these, sorry, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas. So this church in Jerusalem is sending Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. So the last one we read was Antioch helping Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem's helping the church in Antioch. Verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all. So Barnabas came and strengthened that church, exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. So we see the church in Jerusalem sending Barnabas to be a help, to be an encouragement to the church in um, Antioch here, right? And let me tell you right now, we've got a good man, we've got a Barnabas coming in a couple of weeks, his name is Michael, he's coming from the church in Punchbowl, he's their best soul winner, he's out there the most hours than anyone else, he gets the most people saved, he's full of the Holy Ghost, he's a good man, he's going to come and visit us for a week and he's going to come and encourage us, let me tell you that. So we're going to have that happen in practice soon. Um, and lastly, number five, we do see financial aid from one church to another, from the church in Macedonia to the church in Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 to 9, Paul says, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. So Paul says, hey, you guys, I've come to help you, but the financial aid that's come to help you have, has come from other churches. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. So as the brethren from Macedonia supplied the needs for Paul to go and help the Corinthian church. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. And so for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, the Corinthian church were unable to supply the needs for Paul. Paul knew if they helped, it would be a burden upon them. Paul said, look, I'm coming to help you. I don't want to be a burden to you. And so the church from Macedonia, hey, they're willing to help, uh, you know, send me financially, help provide for my needs so I can be a help to you. Okay? So I want you to understand just two things here. There's only two things that I have in this sermon. Number one, we are an independent church. We have Christ as our head. There's no other church in the authority of us. There's no organization, no body, just got Jesus Christ and the Word of God. But that doesn't mean we become isolated. And I've seen churches that have this teaching, they become so isolated, they don't want to fellowship with anyone else because they're not just like them. Hey, if you've read the, the Bibles, the churches in the Bible, they're all dissimilar. You have very faithful churches, you have very bad churches, you have all in between. Okay? And yet what we see, the practice is, if they're like-minded, they're like faith, preaching the right gospel, that they're more than willing to go and help one another. We can see that, right? And so we ought not to feel that we ought to be an isolated church. Hey, we ought to pray for churches that are like-minded, and especially those that believe the gospel as we do. Okay? Now you might ask the question, you know, well, you know, what's, what's your criteria, Kevin, as far as churches go? You know, churches that we're willing to help and be a part of. Um, I'll give you my rule of thumb, okay? But it's really, it's going to come down to a case-by-case -case scenario, all right? If a church reaches out to us and, and wants assistance, it'll be a case-by-case -case scenario, okay? A church wants a fellowship, or we want a fellowship within a church, case-by-case -case scenario, but I do have a rule of thumb. By the way, before I get to this rule of thumb, I have been contacted by other pastors already, right? They just find you online, they contact you. The first thing I ask them, I don't, I don't care if it offends them, is what do you believe? How do you get saved? And after they tell me, it's like, can you lose your salvation, right? I tell them straight away, and, 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 and there's been one pastor that contacted me, you can lose your salvation, it's not faith, it's works. I'm like, I want nothing to do with you, <laughs> right? Another pastor contacts me, he's right on the gospel, it's by faith alone, not of works, you cannot lose it, but he doesn't use the King James Bible, right? Um, but he's my brother, right? He's saved. He just doesn't use the King James. So this is what I mean. What's my rule of thumb? And there's, a, there's another group that's heard my recent sermon that you cannot lose your salvation. And they're like, yeah, but you, you have to endure to the end, you know? And they're like, and then I said, no, you know. And they're like, oh, we'll just have to agree to disagree. We'd really like you to work with us and blah, blah. No. <laughs> right? If you've got another gospel, I'm not working with you. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. I'm not working with you, okay? Get right on the gospel. 
But here's the rule of thumb. Number one. So there's three things. There's really three things you want to look for in a church, right? Number one, they're right on the gospel. That's the main one, okay? Number two, we believe in the King James Bible. We believe it's a perfect preserved word of God. That's the second thing you ought to look for in a church. And number three, that they have some type of evangelism. They have some type of door-knocking ministry where they can speak one-on-one with people and preach the gospel, get them saved. It doesn't have to be every week. They might do it, do it every fortnight. They might do it every month. I wish they did it every week, okay? But at least they're doing something because there are churches out there that do nothing. But when you're looking for a church, those are the three things you're looking for. Right on the gospel, right on the King James Bible, and soul winning. Okay. But what happens if there's a church that's just right on the gospel? They're just right on the gospel, but they don't do King, they're not just King James only, and they don't do soul winning. Well, number one, if they're sound on the gospel, they're my brothers. They're my brothers in Christ. Okay. And the Bible says we ought to love the brethren. Okay. So if there's a church out there that says, hey, we have a need, we, can you please pray for us? You know, we're your brothers in Christ, and I checked it out, and they indeed are, but they're not, you know, they're not aligned with us on these other points. I am more than willing to pray for them. I'm more than willing to love them and pray for them because they are my brother in Christ, okay? And I'm even willing, like we saw in the case where there was a drought and one church helped another, I'm even willing, if they're in some type of emergency and they need some physical aid, I'm more than willing to even help them out with that physical aid, okay? Now, you might differ with me on that, but I'm just saying that's where I stand. That's my rule of thumb. If they're sound in the gospel because they're my brethren and I'm commanded to love them. Now, but that's, that's as far as I go. I, I would not get our churches to fellowship, right? Because if they're teaching something else, then I, that, that, that'll corrupt our minds. If they're teaching false doctrine because of their false Bibles, I would not want to fellowship and, and cause this church to suffer because I've got to give an account to the Lord. All right? Now, what if they're right on the gospel and they're right on the King James Bible but they don't do soul winning? Well, I'm, in that case, I wish they did soul winning, right? And I'd preach soul winning and I'd tell that preacher and the pastor, the bishop, to do soul winning, but I'm still happy to fellowship with that church. I'm happy to fellowship with that church, right? Um, because they sound in the gospel, they're our brethren, but they also teach from the King James Bible. So they're less likely to have, you know, heresy, uh, doctrinal heresy, than the one that is teaching from a false Bible. I'm happy to fellowship with them, but I would not work with them. Okay, I would not work with them because, like we said, what are our church goals? Preach the gospel. And if they're not doing that, then I don't want to work with them, but I'm happy to fellowship with them, okay? Uh, now, the third thing is, if they sound the gospel, the King James only, and they're soul winning, then I'm happy to do all these things. Pray for them, provide physical aid in case of an emergency for them, happy to fellowship with them, and happy to work together, preaching the gospel. If they need laborers, and we're able to send laborers to them to help and preach the gospel in their local area, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. I'm, I'm all for sending resources, whether that's manpower or finances, to get the job done, because that's what we're about. Okay? We're about preaching the gospel to the lost. And if they're doing those three things, I'm happy. You know, and again, guys, you know, just, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you a rule of thumb. Okay? It's still case-by-case case scenario, because they might have all of these three things, but then their church might be full of drunkards, full of fornicators, full of you know, all these things that you know, we're not meant to fellowship with. And in that case, obviously, I would not work with them, okay? But obviously, case by case, it's, it's unlikely that you've got all these three things and they're like that. But, you know, just so you know, uh, that's all I have for you today.